Prepare yourself for the terror. The prison of madness where few enter and none return. Welcome to Unsung Horrors. With Lance. And Erica. Leave all your sanity behind. It can't help you now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unsung Horrors, the podcast where we review underseen horror movies, specifically those with fewer than 1,000 views on Letterboxd. I'm your co-host, Erica, joined by co-host Lance. Hey, everybody. So this episode, it is Lance's pick for the movie. So Lance, can you tell listeners what movie we're covering this episode? Today's episode is the Italian-American produced Primal Rage from 1988. And as of this recording, it only has 552 views on Letterboxd, and it can be found on YouTube to watch. Uh, If you're lucky, you may have picked up the Blu-ray copy of it from Dark Force Entertainment, which was released earlier this year in May, which I think more people should watch this movie. I loved it. I'm excited to talk about it, and I'll probably pick up the Blu-ray just to see what's on the special features. But yeah. Just a quick confession. Uh, I bought, after watching it, I bought the Blu-ray on <laughs> oh. Diabolic, Diabolic has it. So I was like, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to pick this one up. Yeah. This is an, this is like an every Halloween movie for me now. Like, I mean, we'll get into it, but oh man, this is a treat y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely gets you in the Halloween spirit. Yeah. So a uh, quick summary on the movie. Uh, There's a researcher named Dr. Etheridge, played by Bo Svensson, who works at a Florida university and is performing uh, experiments on baboons with an end goal to come up with a method to revitalize damaged brain cells. However, during his testing, he unknowingly creates this rage virus of some sort. And a campus journalist named Duffy breaks into the lab to snap some pictures of the cruelty being done on the tested animals. And he's bitten by one of the infected baboons. Spoiler alert, the baboon escapes and is immediately hit by a campus cop car, killing it. And then Duffy is uh, then infected, starts feeling symptoms and going berserk, killing and biting victims all over the college campus. The virus is spread to Duffy's girlfriend of some sort, Debbie, due to him biting her during a weird makeout session. And then she spreads it to a trio of rapey college dudes, (laughs) causing them all to go on this crazy killing spree of sorts, uh, and then turning them into these gross, blistered-looking zombies with superhuman strength. Duffy's best friend and star of the film, a guy named Sam Nash, played by Patrick Lowe, teams up with his girlfriend Lauren and Dr. Etheridge to stop the spread of the virus. But basically to do this, all the infected people have to be killed as there's no real antidote. Uh, the finale is pretty much just killing the three infected rapey douchebags. Which, and all this takes place at a campus Halloween ball, which is always a good time and fun to watch in movies. I'm a sucker whenever there's a Halloween party in any movies. It's just always effective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's also worth noting, I mean, I already mentioned that the baboon died, but there is a disclaimer at the end of the movie that animals were in no way mistreated during this. Although there is a, a scene where the baboon's freaking out in the cage. That mm-hmm. seems legit, but I guess it was tra- trained. I don't know. Yeah, and when the baboon gets hit by a car, like, I mean, you can tell it's a fake baboon, too. So, um, yeah, as soon as they show him stra- getting strapped in, it's like a hand puppet baboon. It's, yeah. It's, it's fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> So you mentioned um, Sam was played by uh, Patrick Lowe. Patrick Lowe, and I think when you when you mentioned this at the end of the last episode, you said his only other role was what Slumber Party Massacre Two, right? Yeah, he plays the hunk that uh, the girl uh, from Wings was like infatuated with. Okay, and those are his only two movies: this one, uh, Primal Rage, and Slumber Party Massacre Two. And I had to look him up, too, because of Lowe, and he's not related to Rob Lowe, as hot as Patrick is. I was like, is this guy related? I see some similarities, but, you know, they all have the Rob Lowe 80s hair and jawline in these movies. Yeah. 
So yeah, Patrick Lowe's the lead, uh, and he plays a campus journalist, Sam Nash. And again, he's only in Slumber Party Massacre 2. Cheryl Arutt plays his sort of girlfriend, Lauren, and his partner in crime to stop the spread of the virus. Uh, and she doesn't have many movie credits either. I just found some after school specials and some sitcoms in her resume. And then there's Bo Svensson, who plays uh, Dr. Etheridge. He's the guy who creates the virus with the, with, without intention and starts all this shit in the movie. So he's to blame here, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but he has a great look and demeanor in this and plays oblivious, but really committed to his, his research so well. He has these big bottle cap glasses and a tiny ponytail. He's a good yeah. character in this. <laughs> He's very committed to his, his rat tail. Rat, yes. po- rat ponytail, actually. Yes. He pulls it off. It works. As a, you know, it's like a <laughs> professor doctor just, you know, testing on baboons. He's got the look. <laughs> uh, probably my favorite character in this is uh, the guy named Duffy, mm-hmm. played by uh, Mitch Watson. And he plays Patrick Lowe's best friend and is the first to get bit by the baboon. Uh, so he's kind of the reason everything starts spreading, but he's a great character in this. He really like sells his anger and his pain. He's just like this angsty kind of, you know, when he, once you know his backstory, he seems like a rich kid. He has doctor parents and stuff, but yeah, the spread of the, the spread starts when he bites his girlfriend, Debbie played by Sarah Buxton. I had read that she was supposed to play the lead. I guess the lead's considered Lauren. Although I think Sarah uh, Debbie, the Debbie character is way more interesting than Lauren, who's really boring in this. Yeah. But yes, uh, Debbie, she's she's really good in this. And she has like, she doesn't have a lot of movie credits. She had Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead and Nightmare Beach, which when we get to the crew, I'll cover a lot of that because it's like the entire crew on, <laughs> on this. Basically, everybody that worked on Primal Rage worked on Nightmare Beach. Yeah. But what's fascinating about uh, Sarah Buxton it's like the amount of 80s and 90s TV sitcoms she was in. She was in Who's the Boss, 21 Jump Street, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, The Young Riders, Baywatch, Walker, Texas Ranger, Silk Stockings. And she was even in an episode of Freddy's Nightmares. Hey. So she was all over the place uh, on TV. And then there, that's really the main cast. And then there's, there's these three rapey dudes who are into group sex and they play their parts so goddamn well that it's kind of frightening in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, their names are Doug Sloan as Lovejoy. Lovejoy is the leader of the douchebags. Luis Valderrama as Chaz. I never heard their names, but I saw this in the credits. So there's Chaz and then there's Brian played by John Baldwin, who was also in Nightmare Beach. <laughs> <laughs> they're like Wooderson, you know, they're like, they would, the Wooderson from Dazed and Confused would fucking love these dudes. <laughs> 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 that's what i kept thinking like when they were making those fuck their fucking raunchy comments all the time i'm like god damn like, yeah fresh meat like ugh. <laughs> so this is directed by vittario rambaldi who doesn't have a lot of credits to his name along with primal rage all i can find was an action film called decoy starring peter weller and robert patrick that he directed in 1995 uh, and he also directed a film called The Breath of the Soul in 2009, and then an animated feature called Yo Rod, A Friend from Outer Space. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I saw that. I was like, he's only got four movies. And like, this movie's a fucking banger. That's it? Like, it's it's so yeah. weird to me when you've got a movie like this and th- it's like a one and done, one or two and done or something like this, so... Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't know if it was when he, you know, eight, late 80s and he was so good at this genre. Like, uh, I loved, I mean, I'll, I'll hit on some of his, like, can't, like some of his decisions in here. But, yeah, yeah. I, I really wish he would have made more films than this. You mentioned, like, there's a lot of overlap with Nightmare Beach. And so mm-hmm. Rambaldi also wrote or co-wrote the story for Nightmare Beach, too, right? He did, yeah, with okay. Umberto Lindsay. And Lindsay actually wrote Primal Rage. <laughs> so he's credited as Harry Kurt Patrick mm-hmm. uh, as a screenwriter. Uh, and then he co- it was co-written by a guy named uh, James Justice, who also co-wrote Nightmare Beach with, with everybody. Uh, but yeah, pr- like I said, pretty much the entire crew who worked on Primal Rage worked on Nightmare Beach, which came out a year later in 1989. Both the producers, 
the cinematographer, same editor. I mean, I could hit on the names, but really a lot of these, their main credits are Primal Rage and Nightmare Beach. <laughs> like that's it. Uh, but one, the visual effects artist uh, was Carlo Rambaldi, who is Vittorio's, the director's dad. And there's some decent effects and gore sprinkled throughout with, I'm sure the budget they likely had, you know, they're, it's not like a crazy budget movie, but uh, Carlo, who did the effects, he did the original Alien, he did E.T., Close Encounters, uh, David Lynch's Dune, The Neverending Story, Silver Bullet, Stephen King's Cat's Eye, Conan the Destroyer. Like, he has an awesome fucking effects resume. Yeah, Primal Rage was his last, actually his last movie he worked on. And his uh, his brother is, is credited, too, to working on uh, Primal Rage, but Alex Rombaldi. And he has one other effects credit, which is Nightmare Beach. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you know, I guess he didn't he didn't have the the skill that Car- Carlo had in the family. But yeah. And then of course the original score is by the great Claudio Simonetti, who we all know and love. Yes. He, you know, he's done so many so many great fucking uh, scores. Original member of Goblin, longtime Argento collaborator. Um, and he also did the original score for Nightmare Beach. <laughs> and <laughs> the score here in Primal in uh, Primal Rage is it, it's it's pretty fucking metal. Like it has just like kind of shredding guitars and a lot of like fast tempo, uh, almost like double bass drums. Like it, it's it's when anything kind of serious and, and action packed is unfolding on screen, it like Simonetti just kind of amps it up and elevates all the scenes so well. He really does a, like a bang job, bang up job on this thing. Uh, but there are also some catchy songs on the soundtrack, uh, mm-hmm. throughout this movie, which kind of reminds you that you're watching a movie made in the late eighties. <laughs> There's this one song, say the word performed by a band called the facade band. And this song is used three times throughout the film and it's catchy as fuck. So I get it. But it's used in the in both the opening credits and the ending credits, and then I'm assuming it's the real facade band playing on stage during the Halloween ball. I think uh, so. Yeah, that song is a fucking earworm. I was like, I was, yes. I was very thankful for um, the other song that came. I think it's Steel Grave that comes on when the the douchebag guys are trying to rape. Yes. What's her face? Because I was like, is this fucking priest? And then I was like, <laughs> oh, there's not, it's not a Jews priest song, but it sounds like fucking priest. <laughs> yeah. Steel Grave. They had, uh, they had two songs on there. I think one song was called Steel Grave. And then there was one called Knights of the Night. Uh, nice. But yeah, that, that one scene where they like turn on the fucking strobe light and then mm-hmm. put on Steel Grave. It's like, oh God, that's not really set in the mood, but for them it is. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that, that uh, say the word is total bang tango. Like it, that, <laughs> like when it popped on, I was like, oh shit, here we go again. I know how to pick them. <laughs> but looking at the other bands too, I, I, I was just fascinated by the band name. So there's the facade band. Mm-hmm. There was a band called Kissing the Pink, which is huh, a okay. good name. Uh, and the name of their song was Never Too Late to Love You. And then there was Steel Grave. There's a band called the Fast Food Girls with a song called Love Is My Mania. And then there's a, like, a, I don't know if you remember the weird rap song uh, by a band called, or a band called Mondo Buffo. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the song was called I Want to Be a Marine. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? This is awesome. Yeah, it's, it's pretty great. Uh, Steel Grave also has a song in opera, Argento's opera, too. I think. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I don't doubt any of it. I mean, every movie should have this, these bands and all this. Stuff. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what it all boils down to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's really the cast. And then there's some other, you know, small characters like the creepy ass professor. And then the, uh, the student he has a weird relationship with, but they're, they're really not any type of important characters, but that's pretty much it for the cast and crew of primal rage. Oh, I'm so excited to talk about this one. Uh, So we're going to get into more of the film right after this promo from our network. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. 
The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Okay. I have a lot of notes, but okay. it's I think I can probably break them down into like five things that I really like about this movie. Categorically that I like about this movie. Uh, the Halloween party, of course, which we can save till talking about at the end. The score, the soundtrack, which we already kind of talked about. The <clears throat> one-liners in this movie are the, like the offhand phrases, like the dialogue. Uh, the gore and number one on this list, I'm sorry, I love the bully gang. Yeah, I know they're rapists. Yeah. <laughs> I know they suck. But every time they are on screen, it is fucking gold. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have those listed as like a few of my favorite things on here too. The three rapist douchebags are on here because you're right. Their camaraderie is like, they either rehearse their brains out or they're just like really comfortably those dudes because yeah. they were perfect. And every time they were on screen, I, I couldn't look away. <laughs> yeah. They, they just, they have so much energy and it's, it's repulsive, like what they're doing, <laughs> but you, like you can't look away from it because they're so entertaining. It's the weirdest <laughs> thing with them. I love them. <laughs> they're so committed. Like in the scenes when they were all infected and started, you know, raging, you know, while they felt like shit. Yeah. I could tell them like Vittorio Rimbaldi probably was like, okay, you guys can just randomly scream and just go berserk whenever you want <laughs> because they scream like at the top of their lungs, like they're going to fucking bust a blood vessel for no reason. Just like sitting on the couch and it's like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They're not going to cut. They're going to keep recording. This is the scene. It's, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. They do things like, uh, one of them after they get, so the, the, the bully gang attempts to, to, to rape Debbie and she actually has been infected at that point. So she, you know, she's got like the superhuman strength. So she fights them all off and bites all of them. One of them who has a bite, I think it's on his arm, um, pours beer on it because he, you know, thinks like, Oh, it's alcohol. So that will clean it or sterilize it or something like that's the, <laughs> the, the level of intelligence that we're dealing with from them. Well, I think, that, I think Duffy does that in the bathroom when he gets a bit, does he? In the first time. Yeah, I like he's like looking at he's looking at his medicine cabinet and then he's like, there's nothing there, and there's an old open can of like old Milwaukee that oh, he just God. pours oh. on his and then he like, you know, he screams in pain, and I'm like, Well, fucking yeah, you got an open <laughs> bite wound on your arm and you're pouring <laughs> beer. But yeah, the dudes uh yeah, Debbie fucked up those guys real good, which was fun fun to watch. Mm -hmm. What really made that whole scene super creepy, other than them wanting to rape her all at once was as soon as they all kind of high five and get at it, they turn on the strobe light. They turn on, who was it again? Steel, Steel grave. Uh, Steel grave. <laughs> and then they take their clothes off, but they dress up. Yeah. One guy puts like a stocking pantyhose on his face and like a weird, I don't know what it was. It's like a, a just a long fingernail ring. Yeah. Pinky ring. And yeah. One guy puts on like a uh, fucking baseball catcher's mask on. <laughs> and the other dude's just putting fingerless gloves and like, you know, pointing. And I'm like, these guys have a system down. And <laughs> this isn't their first fucking rodeo. It's... No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And those dudes stole every scene they were in. And that's why I was kind of happy that the whole finale is basically Sam, Lauren, having to, needing to kill these guys. I guess Debbie's still around at that point too. Yeah. They're, cause, Cause they're the last three infected. Yeah. So maybe. So speaking of infection, some of the gore in this movie is really, really well, the, before we get to the gore. So you mentioned like Carlo Rambaldi did the effects for this and not just like the gore sort of practical effects, but like when the baboon is like strapped down in the chair, right? Yeah. And you see like its mouth opening, like it's an animatronic baboon. So I'm assuming that was him too that worked yeah. on that. That could and, have been his brother. 
about that point. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, don't know. I mean, it looks like an animatronic baboon, but you yeah. know, like the I'm not here for animatronics. I'm here for the gore, and there's plenty of it. There's lots of pus and blood bursts coming out yeah. of people's heads. Yeah, random like just pops of the temple of like blood just exploding out of Duffy in particular. It's yeah. Like, I'm assuming that's coming like because I if this is like infecting you with rage or whatever then it's got to be not just like physical but mental so it, maybe yeah. it's also affecting the brain and like it's supposed to indicate like they're something's going on in their brain too if it's coming out of the temple I don't know. Yeah, I mean cuz we have when they when, when the baboons first strap down he has his head open. Mm -hmm. You know, they're obviously working on stuff in the brain he's making some sort of protein solution or something right yeah uh, so yeah i would think it, it yeah it does affect the brain which i guess is that's why like people's heads are kind of popping open yeah i love the little blood bursts i love so the professor that you kind of mentioned and it's just some pervert professor who you know the stereotypical girl who's like what can i do to get a better grade and goes on a date with him duffy attacks them while they're like parked the, they're parked um their car is parked out where somewhere i don't know and he jumps in and like rips the skin off of the professor's chin i think i yeah. don't know i didn't get a good look at it but yeah that's what it looked like because okay. it looked like he just ripped like yeah the bottom part of his face off yeah you could like see his bottom teeth kind of like hanging out or just exposed at the end yeah that was great what was your favorite like well, I mean, like the effects, the the effects, like you said, I mean, they were, they were gnarly. Like when they get these, uh, the superhuman strength and they head to the Halloween bash, they walk up to like this vampire kid. Do you remember that? He, pop, <laughs> yeah. he pops over, he pops like around a tree and he's like, ah, and then they just, they just totally rip his throat out all roadhouse style, mm -hmm. like pff, kill him. Um, also like right before that, I think Debbie scalps that weird man baby. Yeah. There's a big dude that's dressed up going to the Halloween party as a, as a baby, as a giant baby. And he's like, Hey man, I like your costume. And she just, uh, rips, you know, grabs him by the head and just, you know, maniac style, just rips his fucking scalp off. Yeah. Uh, and that, that looked great. But once they get in, there's this one scene where they're like walking through the crowd and there's this Rambo, this guy dressed up kind of like Rambo. He kind of pushes him away and they grab his hand and it just, easily rip the skin off of his whole hand. Do you remember that scene? <laughs> yeah. And that was like super like talking about pus and slime. It was all and just, you could see it all just slide off. Yeah. But yeah. And then Sam kills the dude, one of the douchebags with a pipe through the head at the Halloween party. And there's this cool shot from behind the guy where the pipes kind of popping out through the back of the head. Yeah. Uh, really well done. And then of course there's, uh, there's Dr. Etheridge's, uh, death scene which oh. at the very that bumped my fucking rating up immediately i was like holy shit yeah is this for real yeah so should we talk about it right now <laughs> oh um i think this is one of those things where we could describe it the absolute best that we could and it still doesn't prepare you for how great it is so no, yeah def go for definitely it. not yeah go for it <laughs> so uh bo svensson uh his character dr etheridge he ends up they get uh, Debbie who's infected. He wants to like, kind of like do tests on her to maybe try and come up with some cure. He can't do it. He's going to kill her. And she busts loose and ends up what everybody thinks or what a lot of people probably think watching it, uh, killing him. She stabs him in the eye with like this, the syringe that he's going to use to kill her. And then she escapes. And then that's all before the Halloween party. He's kind of out of the picture, but at the very end, Sam and Lauren, are in Lauren's dorm room, like loading up all her shit. And he goes to the car to load up and then boom, uh, Dr. Etheridge pops up and he's infected. And, you know, there's a struggle. Basically they push him off. They push him over the railing of the dorm, which is a few a uh, few stories up and he just falls to his death. And then the next shot is this close up scene of his face. And when he fell, he fell on a sprinkler <laughs> a sprinkler system. So there's a sprinkler that popped through his cheek and the water turns on and it's shooting out of his mouth. So he becomes this human sprinkler. 
and, and when I watched that, I was like, yes, this is this movie. I didn't think could get better. Yeah. And it did. Yeah. And then what I, what I love so much about most of these movies is after that, it just abruptly ends. Basically it's Sam saying, let's get out of here. And then fucking say the word pops up. And, and I'm like, <laughs> this is exactly what I wanted in this movie. But that death scene like exceeded any expert. Nobody could think of that. And it, I loved it. Yeah. I was so happy with this movie already. And then that came up and like, you know, the dummy body goes over the railing and you get a point of view shot from up and you see the body like on the ground. And then you see the sprinkler do like one spurt. Yeah. And I got a little giggle out of that. I'm like, Oh, that's cute. And then <laughs> when it goes down and shows what Lance just described, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? This is fucking fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It was too much. And I, I, I watched it twice. I, I watched it, you know, a little over a week ago. And then I watched it uh, earlier today. Mm-hmm. And the whole time I was like, man, I cannot wait to get to this fucking scene. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the whole movie, the, the pacing is just, I was never bored the entire time. So I yeah. have no, this is it. This movie is such an easy rewatch, rewatch that that's why I want to buy it. Yeah. So, yeah, I can't I can't wait to own this. I'm I'll rewatch it when I get my when I get my Blu-ray cuz the the YouTube copy is fine. It's serviceable, but like I I want to see like I want to see the gore in high def. So Yeah, there's a couple sound issues too and on on the YouTube one I watch. Yeah. Like it seems to like kind of fluctuate good and bad. But mm-hmm. uh but yeah, I want to I want to check out that Blu-ray too. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get my own copy. Don't bo- don't let me borrow it force me to buy it. Okay. <laughs> Get on it. Buy it. Yeah, I am. There's a, there's a couple other deaths that, uh, at the Halloween party that were, I like too. like, they had one guy who I think was dressed up like a, kind of like a scarecrow. And they, they, they tied his neck and then like attached it to the basketball hoop yeah. board thing. And then like lifted it up and, uh, like all these sort of like, what like use what you have at a high school to kill someone like, okay, kill him with that. And then, uh, there was another guy who had this weird, like three sided face head for his costume, but like the the nose was like a spigot or spout (laughs) or something like that. Faucet. Yeah. Faucet. Thank you. And, um, like he gets his neck broken or something like that. And then blood, of course starts coming out of the faucet in his face. And yes. um, one of the, one of the douchebags. So you mentioned the guy who got killed with the, uh, the metal rod through his head. Was it Lovejoy that got smashed by the bleachers? No. Uh, Lovejoy was the last one. That's right. Who okay. got, he got decapitated. That's right. Okay. By Sam. Yeah, but one of them yeah. gets smashed in the in the bleachers, which is okay. That you don't really see much; you just see him just get kind of crushed. But yeah, that's the scene I think would be cleaned up in the Blu-ray because it got real dark, but you could see the head smash and blood just shoot out of the eyes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Oh man, I need to see that better." I, <laughs> yeah, oh, I can't. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, then, then Lovejoy like follows Lauren. Uh, fucking Sam walks up behind him and has an axe. I didn't. Did he pull that off of the wall? Was it like some sort yeah, of... Yeah, they were, they were in like the locker room or something like that. And, you know, there's a axe in case of emergency on the wall. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it comes up behind him and, and chops his head off. Clean cut, just flies in the air. It's so clean. But yeah, the Halloween party, like, like I said, it never fails for me because I could just look at the costumes. If they're done really well that's just pure joy for me. And there's a, there's a lot of fucking cool looking costumes throughout this, this college ball. Yeah. I saw Darth Vader at mm-hmm. Malak bar. There was a guy with like a, his whole head was a nose. Uh, there was that three faced faucet guy, a cowboy skeleton. There were just some really, yeah, and like you said, I mean, there's a lot of the classic, uh, you know, the scarecrows and, you know, all the witches and stuff, but, well, what, the three douchebags were, they had badass costumes. Oh, yeah. They had like the skeleton with the red glowing eyes. I'm, uh, and, but then like Lovejoy had like a fucking like man of war, like fur thong, like over. Oh yeah. I saw that. His, <laughs> his skeleton suit. 
<laughs> I thought it was like a cowboy, like he had a six shooter or something. And I was like, what is that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. The YouTube copy's bad. So maybe it was a six shooter, but I thought it was like a fucking, you know, caveman thong, like fur <laughs> thong. And I was like, okay. <laughs> He's already it. ready for the fucking gangbang. He's not <laughs> <way> there. <laughs> They're putting on their own little touches on each of their skeleton costumes. Yeah. Um, that what I, you know, I, like I, I really only made one note about the Halloween party. And that was that I just want to hit pause and like screenshot all these costumes at the party. Cause I love, you know, I, I love seeing like a Halloween party in a movie, but especially like eighties and earlier, because, you know, nowadays it's just like, sexy garbage woman or whatever. And it's like back then it's like, no, maybe they bought like a mask, but everything else, people are just fucking hodgepodging shit together. And it's awesome. Yeah. These, yeah. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, everybody in the fucking uh, party were just, you know, there for the Halloween party. I mean, the only buzz kills were Sam and Lauren who weren't dressed up and yeah. everybody else was like, Yeah. I, I just love, I love it. Another thing in the movie too, is there's a couple of, uh, dark room scenes, mm. you know, uh, Sam is a photographer. He's a journalist for the, I think it was called the independent voice, the college paper. And he's developing the pictures that Duffy took in this, you know, film dark room. And those are kind of two things that I'm suckers for when it comes to like scenes and films. I love scenes of old film, dark rooms, uh, and Halloween parties. They're just always <laughs> effective. I'm like, if that's in a movie, I'm like, okay, I'm interested. <laughs> just had to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, so one other thing that I loved, I think I mentioned this, was the offhanded phrases and like one-liners that people used in it. So Debbie, she is roommates with with Lauren. And at one point, you know, they're in class or something. And she very weirdly explains some math problem on the board, but it's trying to make it sound like it established like, oh, she's super smart. And then of course, Lauren later is like, oh my God, how'd you know that? And she's like, oh, I have 184 IQ. And she's yeah. like, really? I don't really. And she, and Debbie says something like, guys don't make passes at girls with glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I I knew exactly where you're going with that. (laughs) I actually typed out a list of all the one-liners and this was like, this is the first time I watched it. Nice. Uh, Then I watched it again and threw a four, a few more on there. Yeah. I I just, I typed a few out. I've got two. So I think you probably got that one on there, right? The glasses one. And then I've the, uh, the only, well, I got two others actually. So the other one is uh, stealing monkeys is illegal so is picking your nose in public is one. <laughs> um, and then the other one isn't a quote, but I just made like a note in all caps that Duffy's screams are fucking hilarious. Like yeah. I'm going to do an audio especially, in the insert of it. Like, especially when he's in the, uh, like the campus hospital room when he starts destroying the place. Yeah. And he's just like, blah. Well, I'm not going right. to do it because I'm going to, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of lazy, but then it gets better. And it's like. <laughs> yeah, I'll get the good one in here for the audio insert. <laughs> so what are the other what are the other ones that you wrote down? Uh, I'll just say it through a, a few of them because I have way too many. Okay. <laughs> uh, but most of them were just the douchebags uh, talking to each other. And a lot of them are like, you know, uh, one of them said, listen, numb nuts. Or Duffy might have said that. But my dad used to call me numb nuts as a kid. Numb uh-huh. nuts. Uh, you know, just when he was kind of jokingly upset or some of the other ones. Oh yeah. I mean, a lot of these are distasteful, but that's what fucking primal rage is. So here we go. Uh, the three, the three ra- rapey douchebags, uh, some of theirs was, you know, a new crop of prime freshman titties and we, we need some fresh party meat shit like that. Duffy said at one point they were talking at the bar and he's like, ah, well, a turd is a turd is a turd. Right. It's like, okay. Yeah. That mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sam had uh, mentioned to Duffy uh, at Duffy's place that uh, you bullshit so much, your teeth are brown. <laughs> <Ugh>. Yeah. <laughs> Which I love that. 
So Lauren asks Sam, think he likes Debbie, referring to Duffy. And then he says, do worms like tender young apples? My God, this is gross. <laughs> <laughs> but that same scene is when one, it's Lovejoy. He goes up to, uh, to Debbie and Lauren while Sam and Duffy are taking a piss. But he says, what do you say me and you do it? <laughs> and then he says, what do you say I lose my face in your tits, huh? I'm like, Jesus Christ, these guys are just, you know, they're not holding anything back. They are committed to the fucking role. Yes. Um, And also when they're in the the car, they just yell, beer here. And then they, you know, they're throwing beers at each other. And then uh, when they, when they actually abduct Debbie to take her back to their place, you know, for the the group sex, she's like, leave me alone. I'm sick. And she's clearly, you know, this, 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 I mean, she's not ugly, but she's this zombie, this pus, gross looking zombie. And they say, come on, we'll stick you with something that'll fix you right up. <laughs> and it's just, ugh, they're just so committed to being gross that, yeah. like you said, it, it's some of the best stuff on the in, in the movie to watch. Yeah. Like that, that, what is it? That, that beer here line, they're like, let's kick some ass, like high five, chest bump, ugh, pump on <laughs> iron. Like, it's so like... <laughs> How? How? Like, I I honestly think that, like, yeah, these guys could not have been written this way. They just have to have been this way. Like, maybe they they're, probably, I don't they know. They found them on campus. They found them on that fucking Florida campus. Like, probably yelling the comments to the crew. Yeah. Like, hey, you guys want to be in a fucking movie? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Florida frat boys. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, there's a, there's a lot. Another thing I have that I loved was how 80s this thing was. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's late 80s. It was from released in 88. But as soon, like right out of the gate, it's like a Saved by the Bell episode. You know, you have Sam driving around on a scooter. And he's doing these impossible one-handed camera shots on a scooter. And you can't take a fucking camera shot with a film, like a great picture with a film camera. Yeah. I mean, it's impossible. Uh, but with that facade band, say the word playing, it's it goes hard on those eighty vibes. And then I noticed throughout the dorms and then the co- the college campus offices, there are all these eighties posters pop, uh, popping up on the wall. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna listeners we're gonna date ourselves very much so right now because yeah, we're gonna exactly. like recognize all these things. And you guys, some of you might be like, "What's that?" <laughs> <laughs> Well, the first one and the best one, I mean, I don't think it was the first in the movie, but the first one I have to point out was the Avoid the Noid poster. Did you see that one? I saw the Avoid the Noid, yes. <laughs> I was like, what? I haven't thought of the Noid in 30 years. This is amazing. Yeah. So I actually had, uh, I was reading through some Letterboxd reviews. There's a really long one, but at the end of it, uh, this is from uh, Letterboxd user The Great Owl said, um, one female character has a dorm room poster of Spuds McKenzie from the Bud Light commercial ads. If you're, <laughs> old, if you're old enough to remember Spuds McKenzie, then you are in the primary risk group for COVID-19, <laughs> which hurts my feelings a little bit because no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, we're not there yet. I'm on. close, but not that fucking old. But the one thing that I was very, because my memory fucking sucks, there was one thing in Debbie and Lauren's room that was bugging me for like the whole movie. And then I finally figured it out and I Googled it and I confirmed it. And I was very proud of my brain for remembering it, even though it's the most trivial, dumb, stupid fucking thing. Who cares? But there was, you remember that whole controversy with uh, three men and a baby or something like that. And they had that cardboard cut out of the little boy in the window and everyone oh, yeah. thought it was a ghost, right? Yeah. Okay, so it had this cardboard cutout of these two old men in the background, and I was having flashbacks of that whole controversy of three men and a little lady. But I was staring at it because I was like, that's the most random thing. It's like two old men, cardboard cutouts on this wall in your college dorm room. And then I thought about it, and I was like, that's Bartles and James. Oh, shit. And I Googled it. I I was right. (laughs) <laughs> there was a there was a poster that I that was in uh, that was in Debbie and Lauren's uh, room as well that was driving me crazy and I had to Google it. I thought that's where you were going. Oh, but that's no. awesome. The Bartles and James. 
Because, God, yeah, I used to drink that shit in high, in high school. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one was, uh, it was a Bond poster, the Living Daylights James Bond poster that came out, you know, I guess around the time of, I've never seen that movie. I haven't either. But I recognize, it was Timothy Dalton, I think. That's what I thought it was, but no, it was the one, I, I don't even remember his name. It was, he did one Bond movie and that was it. Oh, okay. But it looked like Timothy Dalton, but when I, I found the actual poster, it was a different it was a different Bond. Yeah, okay. Um, and then on the back of Lauren's bathroom, there was a was it the dog on you said it was a was it Spuds McKenzie that you said was on the surfboard? Yeah. Okay, because I, I thought I saw it said hang twenty on it. And I yeah. guess that's the yeah, it's a dog thing, yeah. Yeah, they put him on the surfboard for the Bud Budweiser okay. commercials. <laughs> I thought it was some <laughs> That's what it was. Okay. I thought it was like some fake fucking movie poster they put up like to, to drive me, to drive me mad. <laughs> <laughs> Any other posters? No, th- those were the only three that I had, uh, that I definitely the avoid the noid. When I saw that, I got really excited for some reason. I was hoping for like a max headroom to pop up or something. I'm surprised. Yeah. I'm maybe it's in there. Maybe I'll, I'll it see it like, next yeah. time I watch it. There's I'm going to, Going to keep an eye out on the rewatch, so we'll see. Yeah, between that and the holiday party, that'll be fun. Yeah, for sure. I did want to point out, uh, I wanted to talk a lot about the weird one-off characters. They Mm -hmm. make little sense, but they're just in there. There's Sam's roommate, who is apparently a gambling nut and plays (laughs) cards for days on end. And that's just thrown out there. And then, you know, scenes later, he ends up just walking into the room looking all fucking disheveled. He's like... I forgot what he says. I'm like, sorry about that. Or and he just crashes on his bed. Like yeah. That whole, that whole, that character was weird. And then there was the weird drunk guy at, in the bar where Duffy kind of drugs him with like a, a, I guess a laxative or something. Oh, that, you know what? I actually made a note about this. This is the first time that I have seen the eye drops in a drink gag to make someone throw up. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> you've got that. And, uh, yeah, the the yeah, the roommate, the gambling roommate was it's like it's like adding that comic relief to it. It's like, "Hey, remember that that thing that we mentioned yeah. a few a few scenes ago? Here's the payoff." You know? Yeah, that's I, I think like, the script, wow. The script worked really well. And there was another there's a there's a f- weird female jogger. Um, I don't know if you remember it, but like Lauren's walking with a shitload of books and I guess she's going to the library or somewhere, but this weird jogger and she's in this super thick like jogging sweatsuit, she opens the door and all her and she knocks all of Lauren's books down. And then Lauren turns around and says something like, Oh, excuse me. And this jogger just there's these other kids walking by and she just plows through them like a football <laughs> player. And I, that felt very like a weird Twin Peaks thing. Cause you know, they're I don't know, if you've seen Twin Peaks, there's there's weird scenes of just, you know, people like doing stupid especially on a campus, students yeah. just like turning around for no reason and running screaming that felt very sw- twin peaks to me and then there was a there was another scene where lauren's leaving the lab or the library and she feels like she's being followed and there's some time spent on this scene kind of building it up you know like okay somebody must be following her but they don't really let on or you don't see shadows and she turns a corner and it's some kind of creepy old man who i guess works at the the lab and he's out of breath and he says she left this on the table I'm like, why is this here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to show that she's scared on campus? I don't I don't understand this. <laughs> yeah. I, there's so many odd choices, but uh, there's a few things that like don't make sense, but it's not like the, you know, it's just so much fun. There's just like, I can't say a damn mean thing about this movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and uh, like I said, it goes back to the script too, because there was one thing that I found really fascinating and that's, there's like no already established relationships here other than like Sam and Duffy, right? All these people kind of meet in the movie. So you see them meet and then you, you get like these really well backstories for all of them. Like you learn Sam has a strict military dad. He won a journalism scholarship from high school for exposing companies, dumping waste into a reservoir. (laughs) So he's out to seek truth. And then there's Duffy's parents who are both doctors. So maybe he's some angsty rich kid. And then there's Debbie who had an abortion and that's why she was, uh, sh- she started school late. Her mm-hmm. dad was a crook. Uh, he was shot. Her mom was in jail for writing bad checks. 
And then Lauren was just kind of boring. Yeah. Uh, she had real no backstory. Like I, I did not, her character was at first I thought, Oh, here's a shower scene. I understand why, why Lauren's in here, but there's no nudity in this at all. Yeah. That actually, I was like, oh, okay, they're just going hundred percent gore on this one. And I was right. like, yeah, Lauren's got nothing to offer. She doesn't have backstory and she doesn't have any nudity. So yeah, she it, sucks. It's, <laughs> it was, it's bizarre too, how her and Sam meet in the very beginning. Yeah. It's like her, her car is going to get towed and he just pop, he rolls up on a scooter and basically kind of threatens the, the tow truck guy. He's like, I'm Sam, I'm Lauren. And then they become like the heroes of the movie. I'm like, this, <laughs> that relationship was weird to me, but yeah, I guess it's like, it was like college, you know, I guess, I don't know. That wasn't my college experience. So whatever. No. <laughs> I, I did think the scene with Duffy and Debbie talking at the pool, mm-hmm. you know, where they were, you know, do going over the whole backstories of each other. Uh, yeah that felt supernatural. Like both of them like acted their asses off and it felt like they were nervously laughing and then they were kissing and that's when he bites her and gets her infected. But yeah, that whole scene, I thought this is, it's just really well, it's well cast, great script. And like I said, the pacing, I was just never bored throughout this whole thing. So what did you end up giving this on letterboxd? I gave it four stars. Yeah. Same. <laughs> I mean, I could see on rewatches it going up too. Well, I mean, very well could, you know, definitely could. So, um, so four stars from both of us on this, if you were going to, um, put this in a double feature, what would be your, what would be your other oh. movie? Let's just look at the whole fucking Patrick Lowe catalog and let's, let's watch slumber party massacre too with it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Lowe double yeah. feature. Nice. Right. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so my initial thought for a double feature was I was like, all right, baboons killing college kids. Obviously I'm going to do Shockma. And then I would like rewatched it. And I was like, no, this movie sucks because like more than a third now, probably like a third of the movie is a real baboon throwing itself against a door. And it just made me really upset because the, the baboon is very angry and hurting itself. And I didn't want to watch that. So I figured, you know what? Let's just have a full night of everyone who worked on nightmares, <laughs> Nightmare Beach <laughs> and Primal <laughs> Rage. Just fucking double bill it with Nightmare Beach. <laughs> That's actually the right answer. There's no other double feature. It's Nightmare Beach and Primal Rage. It's got to be that. <laughs> I think either works, though, for sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. So before we get into... Uh, the ne- my pick for the next movie. Just want to remind everyone that we are halfway through October and there is still time for you to jump in on the Horror Gives Back Movie Challenge, a 31-day cha- movie challenge for the month of October. It's a different movie category for every day of the month. You can check out the list of categories on our social media pages, pick the movies that you want to watch for those categories and start watching. You can share your picks with us uh, every day if you want on social. You can tag us at Unsung Horrors. Uh, use the hashtag Horror Gives Back on those posts as well. Now, the reason it's called the Horror Gives Back Challenge is that we are encouraging participants to donate a chosen amount per movie that they watch to charity. Lance and I are both doing this challenge right now in October and then making our donations to the charities we chose on November 1st. As an added incentive for you, we're also having a giveaway for people who participate and donate as well as share the challenge with their followers on social. We're going to have three prize packages for people who do this. Um, That includes an out-of-print book by Joe Bob Briggs, some artwork by Lance's twin Cody Scheibe, who did our awesome logo, a rare action figure set, some movies, some books, some pins, some stickers. We've got a lot of stuff to give away We're going to announce our winners in our bonus episode on Thursday, November 5th, where Lance and I are going to be going through all of our picks for this challenge. All the details that you need about the challenge and how to enter the giveaway, those are on our social media page. So be sure to check those out, share with your friends. We really want to see as many people as possible watching horror movies for a good cause this month. Yes. Okay. So next episode, it's my pick. And this episode's coming out a few days before... Halloween, 
and a few days before Dia de los Muertos. So I picked a Mexican horror film. It is a horror comedy film, which is not my favorite subgenre. But, you know, I'm breaking out of my comfort zone a little bit with that because it's from 1960. Uh, and it is The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales. It is basically about a taxidermist who decides he is fed up with his wife and is going to kill her and display her. So I'm immediately into it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is directed by, uh, I wish I could roll my R's, Rogelio Gonzalez. Now, he is the same director as The Ship of Monsters, which yes. I... You saw that at um, Fantastic Fest too, right? I did, yeah. Okay. I love that movie. And so as as soon as I found out he had this other movie, this this is actually the one that he is most known for. And then followed by Ship of Monsters. I was super excited. I was like, okay, that's going to be my my pick for Halloween week. And then just to like plug Ship of Monsters again, I actually am... um, did a guest episode on Late Night Psychorama at the end of September. That was one of the movies that we covered. So if you're curious about that, check out that episode from our friends at Late Night Psychorama. All right. Uh, so if you want to stay up to date with all the happenings on our social medias and when the episodes are coming out and stuff with the Horror Gives Back Challenge, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all at Unsung Horrors. You can follow me on Letterboxd under Also Watched. You can also follow my other podcast, Customers Also Watched, which is basically just following a trail of movies uh, streaming for free on Amazon Prime, just strictly following the Customers Also Watch list. That is CAW Podcast on Twitter or Customers Also Watched on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And Lance, where can people find and follow you? You guys can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at L Shibi. That's L S C H I B I. B as a boy. Every time you say it, like when you spell out, no, no, no. When you spell out Shibi, I think of that song, Hush Hush I Do I, or something like that, because like the, (laughs) I don't know, I don't even know what that song is, but like the S C H I B I. Something like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hush hush okay. that's it yeah okay <laughs> all right <laughs> and if you missed uh and you don't want to go back and rewind and figure out where to follow us all the links uh that were easy to find just google that stuff um links to our letterboxd and um lance's store are in our link tree on our instagram and twitter profile we'll see you back halloween week for the skeleton of mrs morales thanks for listening everyone bye bye
Signore